we're starting our graphing today with something that is familiar, uh, partly because we want to bring it back and partly because it's also going to bring back some ideas and bring forward some ideas we're going to be using later on with uh, something that's a little bit newer, less familiar at least, at least a little bit. Now in making this graph, of course, uh, this should be familiar because we can see here that we are uh, going to be shifting it to the right three and then we're going to be going down one. And so you're going to put your first point there, right three and down one. And then once you've plotted that point, then we're drawing our standard quadratic graph from there because of course it's squared. That's what's telling us the shape of the graph. And so then from that first point, I'm going to go over one and up one on both sides. Then I'm going to go over two and up four on both sides and then over three and up nine on both sides because that's that whole perfect square thing, you know? Whatever I go over, I'm squaring whatever that is. So when this is x, this is x squared. Draw the curve through it, and that's what we're looking at for our graph. But the graph isn't all we care about. We want to be able to also identify and bring back some of the other things we looked at earlier, and it's been a while since we've discussed a few of these, like range. Right? We haven't had to talk about range a whole lot. We've just touched on it a little bit here and there. Uh, when we talk about range, First of all, we know that range is talking about either the x values or the y values. Which one is it for range? Is that talking about our x's or our y's? Y yep, it's our y values. And so when we talk about range, we're basically looking to say, how high or low does this graph go? Okay, so in this particular example, you notice that it only goes down so far. It only goes down to negative one. And so for our range, we're going to say that y must be greater than or equal to negative 1. All right, then, is it a function? We haven't had a talk in a little while about something, whether something is or is not a function, so let's remind ourselves on that one. So is this graph an example of a function? Yes, it is. How do we tell? What do we use in order to be able to check that? Yeah, this was the vertical line test. Uh, you're probably having that right idea in mind, but I'd like to remind you of some of the words that we're using when we talked about that. The vertical line test basically says that if I draw a vertical line through the graph anywhere, I should never hit it in more than one place. And so this passes the vertical line test, and therefore, yes, it is a function. Okay, one more question dealing with this one. What's the domain? Now, we haven't actually talked a lot about domain. We touched on it a little bit, but not as much as range. Because domain, well, it is talking about the x values. And if you are a little bit rusty on what domain actually is, you might want to take a moment and write that down, like as part of your note there, that domain is talking about the, the x values, technically the inputs. And so since domain is talking about the possible x values, we go over here and we again look to see, okay, what x values does this particular graph include? And when we do that, uh, it might look at first like it's only going to be including the x values like from here up to here. And so you might be thinking, okay, well, it's just going to be these x's. But of course, the graph doesn't actually end there, right? That's just where the edges of our graphing grid are. If I was actually going to start trying to shade where it was, well, you know, it goes over here, yes, but it keeps going to the left, right? So really, it keeps going left, keeps going left. There's always graph over here. So I know there's continuing to be graph over to the left. And the same kind of thing happens over to the right. So as I keep going to the right, even though the graph is off the grid, we know that it's still going there. We just can't see it because it's off our particular graphing grid. What do we say for the domain in that kind of situation? Yep, all real numbers. And the reason why we haven't talked about domain as much to this point is because basically everything that we've been working with has had a domain of all real numbers, except for one graph that we've touched on a little bit. But we haven't really delved into the domain as much. Well, today we're just making sure that we nail down a few little details about that particular graph. So you see we got a new equation up here. Now we're going to be taking a look at y equals the square root of x minus 3 minus 1. It's purposefully similar to the one you just did, but go ahead and write down this equation. Now graph this on your second graphing grid. Yep, 
And at the start of the year, we did see how we would graph square roots. So we're just really bringing this back and making sure this is solid because this whole unit is talking about radicals as we've been seeing. And so we're also going to roll in our radical graphs to make sure that we're solved on those. So then the first thing we do is we figure out where our starting point is. And our starting point, of course, is going to be to the right three and down one. Exactly the same as it was for the quadratic that we just did. We have the same numbers in the same places. So the starting point is the same. What's different about this one is that it's a square root instead of it being squared, which of course changes the shape of the graph. So instead of whatever I go over squaring that, whatever we go over instead, we're actually going to do the square root of that. All right, so when I go over 1, I'm going to go up the square root of 1, which yes, we can do, right? Square root of 1 is 1. But then this is that one where we don't go over 2 next because the square root of 2 is a big decimal. So how far am I going to go over next instead? 4. And so we're going to go over 4, and the square root of 4 is 2, so it's over 4 and up 2. All right, how far would I go over next? 9, which the square root of 9 is 3. And, but I can't quite go over 9 in this particular case. Uh, it's off my graphing grid. If it fits on yours, go ahead and plot it. But then, since we're off the graphing grid, we can go ahead and draw our curve that goes through it. And again, let's dig into those little details again about uh, range, domain, and function. So, what is the range of this particular equation? So, we can see here that our graph starts down here at negative 1, and then it's going to be going up from there. So, then our range, yes, is going to be y, and it's going to be starting at negative 1. And notice that since it's going up, that means it's going to be greater than or equal to negative 1. Yes, it is or equal to because it actually does include that point right there at 0. All right, next up, what is the domain? If you hint, it is not our real numbers here. So what are we going to say for our domain? It's a description of the x values, right? Yes, and that's exactly right. It's going to be that x is greater than or equal to 3. Now, why is that? Well, if we take a look here at the graph, you know, I can be shading over here saying, yes, there's x values, yes, there's x values, but I can't keep shading, right? At a certain point, there's no more x values. And so then it's saying that the graph exists over at those x values, but it does not exist to the left of it. That's all the domain is getting at there. All right. And then is this an example of a function? Well, does it pass that vertical line test? Yes, it does. And therefore, yes, it is a function. And just to make things short and sweet here, every square root equation will be a function like this then, all of them that we're working with. You can make them into things that are not functions, but as they are that we're dealing with them here, those are functions. All right. Now, this type of graph of the square root is something that we've actually dealt with uh, a decent amount up to this point. But there's still a few little things where we haven't pushed up quite as much. Uh, we haven't done much like this. And so I want to, want to make sure that we can deal with this as well. Because we did this with absolute values. And we did it with quadratics. But we haven't specifically brought this in with our square roots. So go ahead and write this equation down above our last graphing grid. And then go ahead and sketch out that graph. See if you know what to do with it. It does follow all the same rules, so hopefully you do. All right, now, the negative 3. Is that negative 3 moving our graph? Like, is it moving where we start? <coughs> no. And this is one of the big things I really want to make sure to highlight out of this, is that that negative 3 there, that's negative 3 times the square root. It's not subtracting 3, which therefore means that it's going to be more of a stretch, not a shift. And so my first point then, it's still going to be at 0, 0. Okay. Having plotted that, though, our next point will not be over 1 and up 1 as it normally would be. But because I know the next point normally is over 1, up 1, it tells me how to get to the next one. Because the negative 3 is a vertical stretch by a factor of 3 and a reflection. Because the negative is the reflection part and the 3 is the stretch part. So, 
Uh, we are instead of going to be going over one and up one, we will go over one and down three in order to get to our next point. So I'm just taking basically my up one and multiplying it by the negative three. All right. So in order to get to your next point, you have to start by thinking about what would you normally do? Do we normally go over two? And no, we don't. We don't normally go over two, we normally go over four. Because remember, this is square root. If I was just plotting the normal graph, I'd go over one, up one, then I'd go over four and up two. This is where this one can get tricky because we gotta remember that at the same time. So instead of over four and up two, what are we gonna do instead in this case? Well, I still go over the same amount, but instead of up two, where, what are we gonna do? Yep, down six. So we go over four, down six. All right, the next point, let's see if it actually fits on there. Uh, how far over do I normally go next? Yep, nine. And so I'm gonna go over nine. And normally when I go over nine, I go up three. But of course, I'm not gonna go up three in this case. What am I gonna do instead? Down nine. Because I'm taking the normal three that I would go up, and I'm gonna do that three times the negative three from the equation there. And that does give me a negative nine. So it tells me to go down nine. So we go over three and down nine. And yes, that is all of them that we're gonna be able to fit on this particular graphing grid. So we can go ahead and draw the curve that goes through them. All right, so with that in mind, uh, what is our domain going to be now that we can actually see the graph? Yep. It's gonna be that x is greater than or equal to zero. And a couple of you got thrown off because I asked the domain first, whereas the last couple times I asked the range first. Always gotta pay attention to the wording, right? Now it actually is more typical that the domain will come first instead of range. So this is actually the usual order that you might see them in, in case you're keeping track of that sort of thing. All right, so if the domain is x is greater than or equal to zero because it starts over here at zero and then is going to the right there, we now go to our range. Notice our y values start at zero, but this time they go down from zero. And so your range then will be that y is less than or equal to zero. All right, so that takes care of the graphing portion here. Uh, but we're continuing to look at some of the other exponent rules and radicals that we've been looking at recently. And so I'd now like you to practice what we were looking at at the end of last week by simplifying this particular expression. And yes, you can do this on the graph paper or the line paper as you wish. Now the most important thing in being able to deal with this particular one is knowing how to deal with the negative exponent. What does a negative exponent again do in an expression like this? Yeah, the negative exponent always flips it like basically flips it within a fraction. So like, uh, there's a couple ways that you might have dealt with this one and done it. One way is that you might have started by rewriting the whole thing as 5x cubed over x to the ninth, and that'd be good because x to the negative nine means that you have x to the positive nine in your denominator. And then you could go ahead and you could simplify from there. Or you might have instead just started by adding your exponents, which in this case means doing three minus nine, and so then that would give me x to the negative 6. Either way, though, you're going to end up with the same exact answer, which is 5 over x to the 6 power. And you can use whichever method you want in order to be able to get there. The biggest thing that I really want to bring back to your mind is just that reminder that the negative exponent is going to be flipping it in the fraction. All right, now back to our radicals here. Uh, we're gonna be simplifying these radical expressions. This is something we also looked at last week, making sure that we remember the idea behind this, and then we're gonna be seeing where we can take this in the next couple days, even beyond where we have so far. And as you may recall, these are the types where, uh, there's a couple different ways you could do it, but uh, a very common and efficient way is to start by turning it into a fraction, and then turning that fraction into a mixed number. Because then that tells us how many holes we can pull out of it 
which in this case is 7, and what fraction is left over, 1 half. And of course, the fractional exponent, that's a radical. And so I'd change that x to the 1 half back into square root of x. And so then this would be our final answer for the first one. And a good method for getting there. Again, not the only method. Like if you wanted to, you could write out 15 x's and then start circling pairs, but it's still going to get you to the same spot. So for that second one then, that would become x to the 14 thirds. And 14 thirds, 3 goes into 14 four times with 2 left over. Which means then it's going to be x to the 4th, because that's the whole number. And then I change the 2 thirds back into a radical. That is going to be the cube root of x squared. And if we repeat the process for the next one, we end up with x to the power of 22 fourths. And if you just jump straight to figuring out what that is as a mixed number, uh, you'd end up with x to the power of 5 and 2 fourths. But in one of those two steps at least, I hope that you notice that the fraction is reducible. And so yes, you'd want to reduce it. And you can reduce it at either of those two steps. You'll still end up in the same place which is 5 and a half. And so when we change this back into radical form, we'd have x to the power of 5 and then the square root of x. We don't want to say the fourth root of x squared because that can simplify. All right, and then for the last one, uh, we see how many times 5 goes into 30, and it goes in 6 times with nothing left over. So it is x to the 6th and only x to the 6th. That means that one's done. And yes, that is as simplified as we can make it. Now, continuing with the ideas here, uh, we're now going to be looking at some uh, other radicals. Some of these are very simple, straightforward, familiar to deal with, and some of them are not as much, although we do have the skills, as you'll see. So go ahead and write down these three, and then we're going to go through these three together. Now, this is the first time that, at least together, as far as I remember, that we've simplified the cube root of a number. But a lot of the principles are still going to be the same as what we've dealt with before. I just want to be able to see how and why that is. Uh, so, like, if it was a square root of 64, uh, outside of the fact that 64 is a perfect square, you might have actually then made a factor tree of it. And then you could actually simplify it that way. So, like, for 64, uh, that would be 8 times 8 and each of those is 4 and 2, and then I break those down as much as they'll go. Notice the 4s break down, but the 2s don't, so that gives me 2 and 2. So you notice that I have a grand total here of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 2s. And so then I am then simplifying the cube root of 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. Now, if this was a square root, I'd circle the pairs. What am I going to do instead? Yep, we're going to circle sets of three. And so, just like with our square roots, anything that gets circled goes outside of our radical. So, I'm going to have a two outside, and I'm going to have a two outside of the radical. Now, what's going to be left inside of our cube root here? nothing because I circled everything if there's anything left uncircled that would be left inside but there was nothing so it's really just 2 times 2 which is 4 now I wanted you to see that process but hopefully you didn't have to actually do that process because 64 what number cubed equals 64 hopefully you have that one memorized now that it is 4 yes but I wanted you to be able to see how that process would look when dealing with numbers, because I saw us running into some of those questions as we were working on a recent assignment, and something like it at least was coming up along the way. Now, having done that one, then we should now be able to tackle these last two, right? Because these are more of the familiar types that we were just talking about. So if you haven't yet simplified those two, please do so really quickly. 
All right, so for the middle one there, the cube root of x to the 15th, uh, that'd be 15 thirds, which is just 5. So that one is x to the 5th. And then the last one here, the cube root of y cubed, that'd be 3 thirds, so that would just be y. And yes, do keep track of the letters as they're changing. It's going to matter as we go forward. Keep track of this problem. I'm going to bring this particular problem and a couple others back tomorrow as we do a little bit more advanced work with these. Along that same line of thinking, though, let's take a look at this one. You should be able to now simplify each of these four radicals using all the same techniques that we've been talking about. So, please do so. So then these are the answers you should get from working that one through. And all these using all the same techniques that we've been talking about. All right, then the last type of problem that we're going to be looking at today is a little bit of multiplying with fractions and radicals all together here. Uh, please note that when I'm talking about simplifying on this one, when we say simplify, in this particular case, something that's going to be particularly relevant is that we do not want to leave a square root in the denominator. All right, so uh, that rules out doing a couple of things. Like that means that I do not want to just say cancel out the root twos at the start because you might be tempted to do that, but notice I still have this root two in the bottom. All right, so uh, the first thing I want to do is multiply. And remember when multiplying fractions, you multiply straight across the top and straight across the bottom. So on the top, if I do 10 times root two, that's just going to be 10 root 2. On the bottom, I'm going to multiply the square root of 2 by the square root of 2. Now, what does the square root of 2 times the square root of 2 equal? Well, yeah, that would be root 4. And what's the square root of 4? 2. And if I then see that, then notice the 10 over 2 simplifies. It reduces. And so I can then go ahead and reduce that whole thing down and just be 5 root 2. Notice what this did for us with this particular process, and we'll dig more into this process in future days, but notice that what we did is that we successfully managed to get that square root out of the denominator. And what I want you looking for is why it worked the way it did. Continuing with the theme, please do what we did on that last one for this one. Please simplify this. And you'll notice that this one takes a little bit more work. Uh, numbers are a little bit bigger, and we need to be able to grapple with them. Uh, the question is, how? Well, you actually have an option about how you proceed from here. You can just multiply this stuff under the square roots, or you can simplify first. Either way will be fine. So I was mentioning that you could do it either way. Your work would have probably looked like one of those two just depending on which way you chose to do it. Now, you don't have to do it both ways, obviously, but just covering for whichever way you chose to do it. So the way on the left, I'm just multiplying the stuff that is under the square roots together, because as long as they're both under the same radical, we can do that. So like I multiplied the 9 next to the 8 by 72 to get that. And then I multiplied the 72 by 72 to get that. Or you can go ahead and simplify the radicals first, which is what you see happening over here on the right side, where I simplified 9x to the 8th into be 3x to the 4th, and then the square root of 72 is 6 root 2. But whichever way you do it, you still have another step. Uh, in the case of this first one where we multiplied first, we now are just simplifying the radicals. As you can see, the disadvantage there is that the numbers inside your radicals are a little bit bigger to deal with. On the plus side, you already know at least one combination of numbers that gave you that, 9 and 72, when it comes down to breaking them down a little bit. This side, uh, the numbers are a little bit smaller and easier to work with, but it can potentially throw you off in terms of what that really looks like and how that works. So it's all a matter of which way you feel most comfortable. Now a little note here. On the right side, in particular, if I'm going to do, for instance, something like 6 root 2 times 6 root 2, how do I actually do that? Well, when I do that, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to do 6 times 6, and then I'm going to do root 2 times root 2 in order to be able to do that part. 
And so then this is how those would actually finish out from there. So you notice that when I did 6 root 2 times 6 root 2, that gave me 36, because that's the 6 times 6, times 2, which is the root 2 times root 2. And then you notice I just simplified that into be a 72 there. All right, and then over here, we went ahead and we simplified each of those radicals. And we're able to simplify those down. But then at this point, it looks like we do have one last step that we can make. Because you notice the 18 over 72 reduces. And so we're going to reduce that. What can I divide both 18 and 72 by? Let's see here. It looks like 2, yeah, 4, 6, 8. Quite a few of them, actually. In fact, if we keep going down, you might have ended up doing this in a couple stages. The biggest one was 18. You actually can divide both of them by 18. And so then, the 18 divided by 18 on the top just goes to 1. So the top is now x to the fourth root 2. And the bottom, 72 divided by 18, is 4. And so then that is the final answer for that problem. This is then the last problem that we're going to take a look at. And it's actually easier than that last one. It's just a matter of seeing how we can apply all the same ideas and how we deal with the square root with the fraction on the inside. All right, now the first thing that I notice as I look at this is that it looks a little different than some of the problems that I've been looking at before. Because before, uh, we had a fraction on the top and a fraction on the bottom, both of those uh, or not a fraction, a radical on the top and a radical on the bottom. And so the radical was separated. And we knew what to do with it then because we saw how to deal with it. We can actually do the same thing here because the square root of a fraction is the square root of the top over the square root of the bottom. So yes, we can actually go ahead and do that. Now having done that, it's now a matter of actually doing the multiplication and simplifying from there. So please go ahead and do so. Please finish this one off from this point now. So when I multiply across the top, I end up with the square root of 16. And the square root of 16, of course, is 4. And then the root 2 times the root 2 on the bottom is just 2. So notice, whenever I'm multiplying a square root by itself, I'm squaring it, which means the square root goes away and I'm just left with whatever number was on the inside. All right, so now that I have the 4x cubed over 2, notice that does reduce a little bit. I can simplify my fraction. So the final answer is just 2x cubed.